I forgot to bring this uh, last month, so I thought I'd bring it back since no one has seen it in the past, uh, I don't know, four years or so. So uh, we're off to a bit of a late start, but welcome everyone to the October general meeting of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society. This is why I keep asking for help to record the meetings or put them on Zoom because sometimes things go wrong and uh, it'd be nice if uh, it could have an extra hand. But thanks for uh, Pete for helping me trying to work out the issues. Turns out it was a bad uh, battery. It kept cycling all over again. So I'm going to contact the manufacturer and uh, tell them what, where they can stick their defective batteries. Uh, so. As usual, I'm going to start off with the president's report here. Um, I'm going to go through this a little quicker than usual, I think. Uh, I'll start off with uh, really good news is uh, about 10 months ago, uh, we ordered a telescope to keep in the observatory, and it arrived uh, two days ago. <laughs> So uh, we ordered a Skywatcher FlexTube 200P collapsible Dobsonian, basically an 8-inch Dob that you can extend the tube up and down. So it's kind of like an extendable truss tube type design. It's uh, really, really portable. I, I put it together. It was really easy because I, back when I sold telescopes, I put, I don't know how many Orion Dobs together, lots and lots of them. Um, the neat thing is, is the the box had like the cutouts of the you know the base of the dob. So if any, any so if anybody wanted to have the cutouts to build their own dob base, I, I, I can give you those before I condemn them to the recycling. <laughs> so uh, easy to make Dobsonians. Just just trace out the pattern and cut it out, and you're good to go. So we're going to keep that again in, in the observatory. Uh, this was Pete's idea because he said if we had a uh, telescope, he could drag out. He, he would use it during the public observing sessions. And uh, if it's clear for the next one, you better be there. Uh, the other really good news is we paid uh, $555 for it 10 months ago. It's now $755. And, of course, we didn't have to pay the extra because we paid it in full 10 months ago. So we got a pretty good deal on that job. So you'll see it eventually, at least for those of you that actually like to observe and come to the public observing sessions. Otherwise, ne the rest of you will never see it. Uh, we have some outreach opportunities uh, starting tomorrow, October 8th, and on uh, Sunday, October 9th. We're going to do a, a crane fest, which is at the Kiwanis uh, Youth Conservation Area uh, in Calhoun County near uh, Bellevue. Um, Jack, you're going to help out on Saturday, right? And they do have a website, Jack, for those of us that are in the 21st century. So you can go to the website and find out more information. But um, I'm going to be there Sunday, assuming the weather is good. Don was going to be here to uh, talk about it. but. Uh, he had uh, crane fest preparations to make, so uh, Don's not here to take care of stuff like that. And so I'm hoping to have my dual mount uh, to do white light and H-alpha, because the good news is there is stuff to look at. So it uh, should be a good day for solar viewing. I mean, the, the best view of the sun I ever had was at crane fest when I saw this massive prominence, part of a coronal mass ejection fly away from the sun over the course of the day. It was freaking awesome. People weren't uh, pe people that were walking by didn't understand why I was jumping around so excited because they you know they they, they didn't know what was going on because it was really really incredible. It was very unique. Haven't seen anything like that since. Um, I, I think some of you have helped out with this before, but uh, uh, Lisa Winninger, I probably butchered her name a little bit there. She's a, a NASA a solar system ambassador. She actually even works for NASA. She lives in Portage though. Uh, she does lectures occasionally at this uh, pub in Portage. I, I can't remember the exact name of the pub. I didn't make a note of it. But uh, right near the pub is a uh, dog park called Metal Run Dog Park. And she's looking for uh, volunteers again to set up uh, telescopes for viewing at night. It's on Saturday, October 22nd. So if you want to help out uh, Lisa and Portage at the Metal Run Dog Park, um, Again, that's Saturday, October 22nd, assuming skies are clear. I will uh, also mention this in the email too. 
So if you don't have time to like type that into your phone or whatever. Uh, as you know by the email that I sent out on the day that it happened, uh, we finally hit 300 memberships, which is the first time we've ever done that. I never thought we would hit 300 memberships, but sure enough, we did. And uh, we are currently at 304, which means we have uh, uh, 301 paid memberships because there's two lifetime members, me and Bill Nig. Eric will be added soon. And then we have one honorary membership, Fred Espinak, uh, in Arizona. So 304 memberships, 301 of which are actually paid. And so if you were not a member, just remember, uh, memberships are still prorated. It's not, a, it's not as good as a deal as it was, but you get the rest of this year for free. And you can either be a member for the, till the end of 2023 or 2024, depending on how long you buy. Uh, I mentioned last month that we found a Eclipse viewing site. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, check out the September 2022 uh, issue of Prime Focus. We are going to be at the Chuck Bluff River Resort and Park, which is like less than two miles from the center line. How many folks have made reservations at the uh, uh, ranch already? That's it. Nobody else? Just, just me and Anna? You guys are a bunch of freaking deadbeats, I swear. So so I, I know more members have done it than, than what are here, but uh, it's a great site. The weather's going to be good there. I can almost guarantee it. A lot better than I can guarantee it for around here. So don't be a sucker. Come down to Texas where you're guaranteed to see it. Right? Guaranteed. Um, Mike Cook needs help with the library telescope program. I was going to throw up the web page on our website, but of course I don't have time now. But uh, we have uh, two telescopes we check out at the Portage District Library, and we have another one that's going to uh, soon go to the Central Library at the, that's part of the Kalamazoo Public Library System. And um, you know, Mike's really busy with work and uh, family health issues, and so. Uh, he really needs help maintaining those telescopes. And of course, we're always looking to expand the program too. Uh, you can go to our website and find out more information about the library telescope program. So it's not a major commitment. You have to maybe clean the telescopes maybe once a year, once every couple of years and do minor repairs and stuff like that. So it's not like a huge uh, uh, deal. Um, I'm gonna be at the Parchment Community Library on Monday, October 24th at six o'clock PM to give a talk. Uh, the title is Two Great American Eclipses. Um, so if you want to hear about the upcoming eclipses in 2023 and 2024, I got you covered. I'm going to try to record it and put it up on the web or the, the uh, uh, YouTube channel. So if you can't make it, but think you might want to hear it, you can look for it on there if you can't attend in person. We're looking to do a, uh, another field trip. We're going to try to get back to some sense of normalcy here before the nuclear Arm Armageddon uh, hits us here soon. So uh, we're going to be uh, going to Abrams Planetarium on either Saturday, November 5th or the 12th. I was curious to see if anyone had a preference that might be interested in going. So what we do, of course, Jack already mentioned it, sort of. We, uh, we meet at a site for carpooling and then we drive to Turkeyville. We get doped up on tryptophan so we can sleep to the planetarium show. And then of course we go from Turkeyville to the planetarium and we watch a show. They're doing one on uh, uh, Mayan astronomy, like archeo astronomy. But of course, uh, uh, besides the can show, they always do a nice little night sky tour. That's really, really fun. So for those of you that are interested in going, do you prefer the fifth or the 12th? So we got one 12th, fifth for Beverly. Oh, it's not going well. We're split. You guys can fight back there since you're sitting, sitting near, near, near each other. Anybody else have any preferences? You guys are a fun group. Boy, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, next month, we're going to have opening nominations for the board, uh, given the way things are going tonight. I think they're going to go really smoothly next month. Uh, we will have one opening uh, for publicity manager. So. Um, if not, uh, if you're not interested in doing the position as a board position, we could make it a volunteer position 
or uh, something tells me I'll just end up taking that up again, but it's even easier than it used to be because there's not too many places to submit stuff to anymore because they're all kind of going away. Uh, I only have uh, one this calendar year. Uh, at the end of August, I had two nights uh, where, uh, well, actually there were four clear nights. Two nights I invested in the Wizard Nebula and ended up with this picture. Uh, this is in LRGB. I have about two hours on each filter. Uh, my Telescope here is a, a William Optics uh, 132. And I'm not sure what else you want me to say about this. What constellation is this in, Roy? Uh, this is... Uh, it's, it, it's over near Deneb. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly which Cephas it's in. Cepheus sickness? I don't, I don't know offhand. It's, uh, probably Cepheus. Okay. Very good. But uh, here in Columbus, um, we only have had a, a handful of days that that are uh, nights that were clear, uh, and most of them were conflict nights for other events we had. So uh, the end of August, I got four nights out of, uh, I think there were actually only four, four clear nights. Great. And you took this set that, uh, did you mention the park? Uh, it, the, there's an area called Hocking Hills, which is uh, uh, southeast of Columbus, about an hour away hour and a quarter away. Uh, it's kind of like our darkest area, but it's uh, pushing a portal four. But it's the, Ohio is a really bright bright state on the dark sky map. John Glenn. The John Glenn Astronomical Park. Right, the, yes, the John Glenn Astronomy Park, yeah. Yeah. That sounds pretty cool. All right, thank you, Roy. Some round of applause there. Okay. I should mention that uh, Roy is joining us from uh, Columbus, Ohio, or at least the Columbus vicinity. And that's a first for Astrophoto Night. We've never had anyone share photos from another state. <laughs> well, that's Dana's fault. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> we love you people. You have such a great club. We're thrilled to be associate members. We're glad to have you. So the pictures that I'm going to be showing uh, are taken with these two telescopes, just so that uh, you can see the difference. Uh, the one on the left is uh, a Red Cat 71. It has a 350 millimeter focal length. And uh, the one on the right is an RC8, and that has a 1620 millimeter focal length. So you'll be able to see uh, the difference in the field of view uh, in these uh, upcoming photographs. And everyone <clears throat> should be uh, familiar with the Orion Nebula, um, M42, and, and this is uh, just 30 seconds. I just wanted to, again, highlight the difference in the two fields of views uh, between the two telescopes that I use. So this is the, at 350 millimeter, uh, the Orion Nebula. This is uh, just a quick 30 second shot. And uh, then a single uh, 10 second shot uh, at 1620. And so you can see uh, quite a drastic difference uh, in the field of view. Uh, one I use for the, the larger, uh, more nebula shots and uh, this uh, longer focal length I don't use for the, the smaller targets, of course, planetary and small galaxies. Um, so this is uh, the Horus Head, also in the same constellation. Um, at uh, the shorter focal length, uh, includes the Flame Nebula. Um, this was shot at uh, uh, Sterling uh, State Park uh, over on the east side of the state. Uh, here, just uh, 
last weekend. Uh, just a quick 30 minutes. Uh, they do have a, um, a steam powered uh, power plant uh, near the state park uh, that uh, uh, gets all lit up at night. So you can see the, the uh, gradient. Uh, I don't do any post processing on these photos. Uh, and so that gradient uh, there on the right side of the screen is, is still present. Uh, but that is uh, 30 minutes. And uh, the same 30 minutes on the uh, um, larger telescope or the longer focal length of just the horse head. Uh, again, showing the, the different uh, focal lengths. Uh, this is uh, two and a half hours on M33, uh, another very popular uh, target. Uh, using the Red Cat 71, and then with the uh, the eight inch, uh, three hours, uh, and uh, an L Pro just to tighten up the stars, uh, an L Pro filter um, to tighten up the stars and uh, get a little deeper uh, at the longer focal length. Uh, all this was done uh, again last weekend um, at the state park uh, M45 at the uh, shorter focal length. Uh, I think Richard has a really nice uh, M45 uh, posted on the website uh, from the remote telescope, I think uh, a very nice long integration, uh, but this one is uh, just two hours. Uh, I was able uh, a few weeks back uh, from Battle Creek, um, the fireworks galaxy. Uh, this was three hours. Uh, I had never done the fireworks galaxy. Um, interesting target. Uh, I enjoyed doing this one. I think uh, most of these are, are with the uh, longer focal length now. Uh, quick uh, one hour on the Crab Nebula, I, uh, M1. I do want to do more time on this one. Uh, you can start to see the, uh, the filament structure um there in, in the crab nebula so i would like to uh, get a longer integration on this um as as the season progresses and, and as we get uh, more clear nights uh, i should be able to uh, match the same frame and be able to add more data uh, but this is the one hour that i have so far uh, moving on at uh, the garden getaway that we had recently is uh, the Cocoon Nebula that I shot two and a half hours. Uh, we had a great time up there. Thanks again, Dave, uh, for hosting us. Uh, wonderful time. Um, and uh, I had never shot a Cocoon Nebula either and uh, was excited to be able to uh, get this uh, as well. Uh, this is with a, a dual band uh, filter at the longer focal length. And uh, just, to, uh, I have uh, spoken uh, with the club previously about uh, the practice of EAA and what can be done with uh, very short exposure. Um, you know, not really astrophotography, but just using a camera to see more than uh, you can with a naked eye. This is a, um, a 30 second shot of uh, M16, just a single sub. Um, just to kind of show you, you know, what you can get even uh, using an alt as uh, type mount, uh, short focal length, uh, I'm sorry, a short integration or a short uh, um, exposure. Um, so that's uh, M16. And uh, another example is uh, the Triffin Nebula. Again, another popular target, uh, but also just uh, a quick 30 second single sub uh, of what's possible. Um, not really doing astrophotography so much as just uh, using the camera to uh, see more than you would uh, otherwise, uh, whether that's to combat light pollution uh, or um, failing eyesight uh, or other uh, adverse conditions. Sometimes using the, uh, the camera uh, can yield uh, very, very pleasant results. Uh, and I believe, oh, and then the last one, and uh, I don't know if uh, that's large enough. Uh, this was just uh, when I did this this past summer, uh, just using a, a C90 
Max Hudov uh, on a small alt as scope, uh, a solar shot with just a, a simple um, solar filter from Thousand Oaks. Uh, but I like the, the, the structure and the detail. Uh, and again, just uh, using modest equipment, uh, a C90, uh, you can uh, get uh, very pleasant results. So uh, I, that's, that's all I have. And uh, thank you for the opportunity. So like uh, Richard said, I only had, I only have one image tonight. Um, it's been, life has been getting in the way of, of my hobby. So as I'm sure many of you understand, but um, I was able to finish this one before the meeting today. So I thought I would share. Um, I think uh, many of you probably know what this one is. This is the, the Pac-Man Nebula. Um, it's a emission nebula um, in Cassiopeia. I took this over four nights um, last fall with my um, Astrotech um, AT7280 ED, um, at 344 millimeter focal length, which is actually pretty short. This is a this is a cropped image, so it's it's a little too short for this target, but um, it was one that I wanted to capture. Um, I took this one from my driveway. It's about Bortle 5 here in Matawan. Um, the interesting things about um, about the uh, Pac-Man Nebula is it's, it's got these Bach globules and um, these dust lanes and a double star located right here at the center. Um, you can't really, the resolution's not quite good enough at this focal length to see it. It doesn't really split them, but um, in, in some more uh, high resolution photos, you can see it. Um, they, the, the, the nebula is a star forming region and the, the stars that are located there um, in the center of the nebula are only about three and a half million years old. So it's, they're all fairly young on the uh, cosmic time scale. Um, this is of course uh, shot in, in narrow band. So it's uh, using my Antlia uh, filters and my QHY 268M. Um, this is the, the, the most exposure I've ever gotten on a single target is 35 and a half hours of exposure. And I process this in PixInsight. So hopefully next year I can, uh, capture a few more than, than a single one, but this is all I got tonight. Yep. The last uh, couple of years when I've given presentations on uh, astrophotography night, I use a CCD chip, uh, Luminera Skymix chip, monochrome using three color filters. And then the last year, I have been using a, a ASI 178 color CMOS chip camera. And that seems to require big changes in how the uh, images are worked up. And the ones that I have here are taken with a Celestron 14 inch Edge HD on a software bisque mount at prime focus. Typically it's about 30 minutes of data gathering, and two months of computer work for a picture. For Saturn, getting a reasonable shot of the Cassini vision requires very stable air for imaging and lots of trial and error in working up the results. This is about as well as I'm able to get to show the Cassini division. For Jupiter, the first image shows a red spot on the lower left. And it wasn't very obvious actually until the processing was done. I wasn't really aware I was collecting that. The second shot is two hours, about two hours later, 
and Jupiter has rotated that much till Saturn's on the or till the red spots on the lower right side. So that that's it for the pictures. I just want to mention I don't have very dark skies here at Friendship Village, but the residents here get an unusual chance to do stargazing without leaving the site. So we do have uh, as often as we can get to it and have viewing for the residents. That's all thanks. So um, this has been a long week. Uh, all but the first two photos you'll see tonight, the, the first two I processed or took and processed a long time ago, months and months ago, but all the others I did this week. So uh, I, I sacrificed all the nice weather we had this week uh, to process pictures and kind of represent uh, both Owl Observatory and the remote telescope. So, so we have some stuff to share. And this is the first one. So um, since we're kind of going along here, I'm not going to tell you the backstory behind this. It is not pleasant. But uh, I, I drove out to this place, uh, this uh, industrial or this uh, like condo complex under construction. It was just a big open field with trees torn down and all that sort of thing. And set up and took this picture, of course, of uh, the moon and Venus. So uh, this is the really s simple uh, picture, just a camera on a tripod and uh, with a uh, 100 to 300 millimeter zoom lens that I set at 100 millimeters to get some of the foreground in there so it looks uh, pretty. And just took a two second shot and processed it with uh, um, Adobe Lightroom and Photoshop and that was it. So again, not all astrophotography has to be really complicated. This is a very, very simple shot. Anybody could do this, even Sinclair. <laughs> okay, so now the images that I will show you were taken out at Owl Observatory with the Leonard James Ashby Telescope, but more specifically, uh, Nona, which is our uh, Teleview 101. You know, Leonard James Ashby's wife, her, her name was Nona, so we call the Teleview Nona. So all the pictures were taken with that. So I had the moon, everybody, so there you go. So here is the moon. And again, this was taken with the Teleview. Uh, uh, this is the only shot taken with the Teleview with my camera, which is a full frame Canon uh, 6D. Of course, the main mount, as you saw in the previous shot, is an Astrophysics uh, 1600. And this is just a really quick uh, 1 2 50th of a second exposure. And that's it. So again, really, really simple shot that anybody could do because all you got to do is go out to our observatory, point it at the moon, and take a picture. It's really, really easy. Of course, the rest are a little more complicated, but not too much more. Um, this was taken at the very end of a night, uh, a long night imaging something else that I don't recall right now. But this is just a really, really short uh, series of pictures. I just took uh, 13 two-minute shots and uh, uh, you know, stacked them and all that, stacked them and aligned them and picks in sight. Uh, there are no darks, no bias, no flats. So that's why we got the uh, little glow here on the edges. If I did all that, I would have gotten rid of that, but I haven't gotten that sophisticated out at all observatory yet. When I do flats, I'll just use my iPad uh, for a flat screen. And, uh, but I don't want to sit out at the observatory and do darks because you just sit out there taking pictures of the back of the shutter. And that's no fun. Uh, so eventually I got to bring the, the camera here home and uh, do a bunch of uh, dark frames so, so we can uh, keep those on the computer out there and people can use them to properly process the picture. But PixInsight does a decent job of uh, getting rid of a lot of the noise. It was, uh, it was a little noisier. So of course, this is the famous double cluster in Perseus which uh, is getting high on the sky right now. But again, this was really, really late in the night in July to get it um, above the trees at the Nature Center. Uh, this one I just processed today. So of course, uh, you know this one. This is the uh, Great Andromeda Galaxy, M31. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, now, now we're off to a good start here. Oh, just wait, you haven't seen anything yet. So 
just remember, I'm at Owl Observatory. There's no internet. And you know, I, I don't have a smartphone, so there's nothing for me to do when the camera is taking pictures through the telescope. I just sit out there doing nothing. So just remember, four and a half hours of just sitting out there on a couple different nights doing nothing. And it is really, really fun. Usually I, I, I bring a, a folding reclining lawn chair and just lie back in the observatory because I can't sit on that, be that bench out there for four hours or so and, uh, and make myself comfy out there. I, I tend to listen to music. So if you do come out, when I'm out there imaging one night, you'll probably hear Pink Floyd or something like that. And, um, I try not to blare it too loud because there's usually camps going on. But uh, yeah, this turned out really, really well for no uh, 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 flats or biases. This is an HDR image. So I took, uh, uh, you know, 10, 30 second, 92 minute, 17, five minute pictures. And um, the one thing I really discovered with PowerPoint, or not PowerPoint, but PixInsight that's really cool is the photometric calibration. Because when you first open the uh, color images, the background's like all green. Partly probably from the filter, the the uh, the L, the uh, Optolong L Pro filter, and uh, partly from the light pollution out there. But you use that photometric filter, and boom, the sky's black. And then you can make it blacker from there because it's not like black black. So yeah, this one turned out really really well. I was pretty happy with it. This is better than the image I took at the Oki Tech Star party like 12 years ago. But if I go back and process it again, it'll probably look even better than this one. So this is uh, M32 and M110 for those of you that don't know. But there it is, that turned out pretty well. And this is the Elephant's Trunk Nebula or IC1396, which is in Cepheus. Unfortunately, the uh, chip in the uh, CMOS camera is not big enough to get the entire thing because you know, it's this big circular uh, uh, feature. But the, uh, the telescope out west can do it, at least the, the Takahashi, especially when we get the new focuser installed, which I keep forgetting to bring with me. So uh, this is only one hour. I took three 20-minute shots. Again, this was like toward the end of the night. I figured, what the heck, I'll just blow an hour taking a picture of this. I didn't think the results would turn out nearly as well as they did. But boy, you can really do wonders with PixInsight. You know, again, I, I took a crash course in using PixInsight this week. Uh, to, to process pictures like this. Yes. No darks, There's just lights. Okay. Nothing but lights. Yep. Was I? Okay. So here is the Pelican Nebula, IC5070, which is right near the North America ne Nebula in Cygnus, not terribly far from Deneb, which is uh, just out of the frame. And this is only, you know, one and three quarter hours, just seven 15 minute shots. Again, no no flats, no bias, no darks. Uh, removing as much of the noise as I can in PixInsight using various techniques. I probably couldn't remember all of them if I tried. But uh, yeah, th there are several ways to attack noise. And uh, you can see uh, the, the, the pelican's eye, it's kind of j just above the center here. Uh, and there's a mouth going off to the upper left, and, uh, and he kind of has this, uh, I don't know, the point of his head. I'm sure there's a name for the point of the head on the pelican, but I'm not sure what it is. But you have this cool cloud with this little spire in the center, and it's just really, really neat. Very, very popular area to take pictures of. And I should mention, uh, as with all these nebulous pictures from the observatory, they're taken with an Optolong L enhanced filter, which really helps block out the light pollution. It's kind of a two, two, two stage um, or double combined uh, narrow band filter, H alpha mainly. This is the one I worked uh, the longest on. This is like the first one I took uh, right when the pandemic was going. So, you know, there's not a lot to do. And uh, so, yeah, this is a, a combined uh, 25, 15 minute shots for six and a quarter hours. Again, at the observatory with nothing to do when it's taking the pictures. But now that we've got the dab out there, maybe I can at least use the dab for a while to observe. We do have binoculars out there. I have made use of the binoculars that we have out there. Uh, no, I did not do the salt bubble. I've never done that yet. It should be in the frame. I don't see it. Huh. Well, I don't know. 
<laughs> I thought that was further off in the distance. Okay. Huh. So this is the crescent nebula, because when you look at it through a telescope, this part here is a crescent. And usually you can't see the rest of it, but of course when you image it, you can see the whole thing, which looks like uh, you know Stewie's head, if, you, if you're familiar with Stewie. It's uh, um, ejected material from a wolf rayet star. So I, I'm not, I, I don't believe, I'm not sure if this is the wolf rayet star, which is like a super giant blue star that's just kicking off all kinds of stuff. And, that, and that's what we see. And I believe all of this other red stuff is not associated uh, with this nebula in any way. It's just stuck in the background along the, along the plane of the Milky Way. Yeah. It is a full color camera, right? So there's no red, green, blue, all that sort of thing. That stuff is coming here shortly. Okay, so speaking of which, uh, the, the, the rest of the images are with the uh, flagship of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society, the KAS Remote Telescope. Uh, you know, somebody has to represent the remote telescope here since I can't get uh, all of our sky shooters to actually use it. I discovered uh, too late, I guess, really, that apparently one major requirement of taking pictures is, for some reason, people think you have to own the equipment, but you don't. So we have much better equipment under much better skies that members can take advantage of. And uh, so that's why, I, that's why I busted my arse this week to show you at least a few of the pictures and show you what the remote telescope can really do. And these are much better than the pictures I showed you before. So here, here we go. And all these pictures are with the uh, plane wave. Since we discovered uh, the focuser of the Takahashi uh, cannot support the weight of our camera, I kind of quit uh, using the Takahashi until we get the new, uh, the new focuser installed. Here we go, here's the first one. So, yep, this is the famous M13, the globular cluster in the constellation Hercules, or just M13 to his friends. And, uh, you know, you see a whole bunch of dates here in 2019, and I guarantee you on at least one or two of these nights, I just took like one picture. <laughs> Um, so so mo most of the images you see uh, collected here uh, were, were taken on at least a few of these nights, but probably like two or three of these nights, and the rest are just one picture. I figured they're good pictures, might as well throw them in. And uh, so I tried to do the HDR thing in here. I think it worked out fairly well. I'm not sure I did it 100% right this time, because I, I should have brought out the core a little bit better than I did. So yeah, it's a lot, 82 <laughs> 30-second shots, each of which are like 32 megabytes. It doesn't matter if it's one second or uh, 30 minutes, it's a 32 megabyte picture, each one. So it really adds up when you do a bunch of short ones. And you can see the various color images too. Uh, this time I actually did enough RGB to help bring it out a bit, but um, I could not get the photometric calibration to work on the remote telescope images. It kept failing for some reason and with the limited time I had this week, I couldn't figure it out, so with a little more learning, I'm going to try to bring up the uh, star color for future use here. And of course, I, I don't recall the designation of the galaxy, but you can see that famous spiral galaxy that a lot of people look for near M13 when they're observing it, but there it is down there. So I'll give you a few more minutes to count the stars. Okay, that's good. So uh, this is with an old-fashioned, I guess, now CCD camera. It's a full-frame camera. Uh, 36 millimeters uh, squared, so that's why it's a square image, because uh, the chip is squared. It makes it look smaller compared to the w wider images taken with the CMOS camera at Al Observatory, but, uh, but it's a big camera, like 4,000 by 4,000 pixels. And many of you know uh, that I really love edge-on galaxies. So the next two are probably the most famous edge-on galaxies in the sky. And uh, I keep forgetting the name of this one, so that's why I'm glad I got the marker here. So I just refer to it as NGC 891, the silver sliver galaxy. But when you really process it and bring out the color, maybe a little better here, it's actually kind of a yellowish color. So I don't know why they call it the silver sliver galaxy, because uh, maybe that's its visual appearance, of course. And so, uh, again, this was a pretty large project. 
Uh, not as many hours as Lloyd put into his uh, picture that he shared. But again, some of these nights, it, it was probably just like one picture. <laughs> uh, but this was a, a pretty large commitment. And um, so this was, this was the first one I processed earlier this week. And I, I kept making mistakes and had to go uh, do it over again and finally got a decent result. But, yeah, that sucker is like right edge on. And it's way over, uh, way north in Andromeda, right near um, probably Cepheus in that area. But it's way over in Andromeda. Nowhere near the Andromeda galaxy. So here's the other famous edge on galaxy in the sky. This is one of my absolute favorite galaxies in the sky. Uh, this is NGC 4565 in Coma Berenices, the only constellation that has a true story behind it, but I'm not going to tell it to you now. And uh, so, th again, this is one of the best edge-on galaxies in the, in the entire sky. I just love this one. And uh, nearby you can see uh, NGC 4562, just another galaxy that's part of a coma cluster of galaxies, at least I presume. There's a lot of... Um, there's a lot other, uh, many other galaxies in this image. You can kind of see one down here, uh, but you really have to see it on the screen and zoom in to really, really catch them because they're very, very distant. But there's a ton of other galaxies in these pictures. And here's the last one. So last year I showed you my uh, in progress. Uh, version uh, that was all black and white because I, I didn't have all the color data and I still don't have as much color data as I want. I had to probably overdo it a little bit. That's why it looks a little funky, I think, in areas. It looks really grainy up here, and but I think a little more color data will help uh, uh, bring that out. But um, like Pete, next time we're e emailing each other when we're imaging, Make sure you email me back and say, hey, moron, take RGB more. Because I like doing the luminant stuff too much. I like seeing those new images pop on the screen. Because, you know, they don't look quite as good in red and green and blue filters. All right, so that's it from Owl Observatory and uh, the Remote Telescope. Hi. So this is... Um what I've done for last this past year, um, back in February, uh, uh, this telescope, this 12-inch uh, F4 reflector came up for sale from a mutual friend on the east side of the state. So I drove way over, actually up by Flint, um, to pick it up. Um, it was quite big. Um, this is a uh, astrophysics uh, 1100 mount inside my little next dome. Uh, it's three meters. It is really tight in there. It Actually, I had to raise the observatory up a foot it's on a, on a deck here. I had to raise up an additional foot in the air because the very top here would hit the shutter motor system and that created all sorts of mayhem one night. Uh, yeah. So uh, focuser I use is a uh, Optech uh, TCFS. Uh, they're up there in Lowell by Grand Rapids. They're really nice people. Um, because it's an F4, it has lots of coma, um, lots and lots of coma. So I do have a Paracore Type 2, which is stuffed in there somewhere. Uh, my camera, I just upgraded to a QHY uh, 294M. So I went to the CMOS finally. Um, I still have my CCD. It's still there, so don't panic. Um, and like Richard was mentioning, these file sizes are quite big, 23 megs for me for each one. Um, I just recently upgraded to a new Q QHY filter wheel and off-axis guider. Um, just to make it a complete system. And I use a little Lodestar X2 or 2X. And I also, with this whole setup, realized that inch and a quarter filters vignette so bad. So I upgraded to 36 millimeter. Um, Deep Sky by Astronomics, a uh, very good set there. Um, the blue has a really nice good cutoff. So if you have a refractor that's not well corrected in blue, it chops it off right before it gets to your, your blue bloat, they call it. Um, and then their L3 luminance, they have an L1, L2, L3, depending on how much light pollution you have, you got to deal with. L3 is a little more stronger. Um, and then I also have their H-alpha and O3 filters. So, so this is what I'm taking all the pictures I'm presenting tonight with. Um, I use Sequence Generator Pro. Um, I'll get it going, sometimes chat with Richard and um, watch YouTube videos and then go to sleep. Hopefully, 
it all closes up at night at the end. Okay, let's see here. So it's supposed to be the middle button for some reason that doesn't yeah. want to work. Okay. Whatever, this should be. Didn't freeze up on us, did it? I think so. Oh, no, there. There you go. Okay. Okay, so the first image, my uh, first light, um, there wasn't much out. I can see, I think it was like full moon or right around there. It's the uh, Owl Nebula up in Ursa Major, up in the Big Dipper. Um, total of seven hours, 30 minutes. It's just uh, bicolor, so using H alpha and O3 since I didn't have my S2 filter and I still don't have it. But you can see the little halo uh, around it. Um, I was still trying to figure out collimation and I haven't used the Newtonian in quite a while, so that was, it's been an adventure this year. Um, that's a pretty, pretty neat little uh, planetary nebula. <laughs> I should have took it at the Owl Observatory. It yeah. even better. So my next image I took, I threw a, just threw a lot of time at this 13 hours. It's a LRGB of the, um, oops. I don't know what I'm doing now. That works too well. Yeah, no, it works too well. I can't even see. Oh, well. Um, yeah, M106, uh, basically eight hours of lumens. I like lumens also for a lot at it. Uh, do some color processing with the uh, RGB. Um, I went really deep with this one. Um, I wanted to see how far, and you could see there's a little picture right here. Um, there's a really neat plugin you can get for Pix Insight that will show you all sorts of stuff. And there's also one for quasars. So I'm like, oh, I wonder how far I got into this. So basically down in this general area right here, the lower right, 21st magnitude quasar, which is a redshift of 3.7, which is 12 billion light years away. Um, now my backyard is out in, out in the sticks, but it's still Bordo 5, Bordo 4, depends on the night and if the neighbors are burning fires or whatever. Um, but been pretty pretty happy. I love galaxies. It's a central theme. Um, what is this? Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, in here. Well, there's a little dot right there, but it is actually in this. Yeah. It is. I'm trying to match them both up. Yeah, it's been a little bit. Oh, actually, no, it's right. It's in there. Trust me. <laughs> It's been a while since I looked at this picture. Um, it's my version of M51 um, with uh, IC4263. Um, it's a lot shorter focal length than the uh, remote telescope, so obviously I get, you can suck in a little bit more of, uh, of what's out there. Um, got a little bit of an edge on right here, and I got that. I don't even know what one that is. I no can't figure that one out. Uh, nine hours. Um, I found when you shoot at f4, it's a lot faster than f7 or f10. So I can really uh, keep my exposures uh, total time down and get what I used to be able to get with my, uh, my 8 inch RC at f7. And just for Richard, ah. I got my edge on um, up in Draco, uh, 5907, the Splinter Galaxy. That'd be a really good one for the remote. Um, I had some really weird flaring going on. Um, I think that was from some fog that came in from the you know, swampy lands I'm in. Uh, eight hours, 55 minutes, LRGB. Um, so most of the time in the lumens as usual. And I went after a pile of stars in this one. Uh, M27, the Dumbbell Nebula. Uh, five hours, five and a half hours. This is about July, so you know we only got what four hours of, <laughs> if that. Um, H alpha, RGB. So I didn't do any luminous uh, H alpha. Um, it's one approach you can do. So you can get a little bit of the wings and all that fun stuff. Um, when I did the um, the alignment and picks inside, it actually counts how many stars you got in here, and there was like twenty two thousand something in here just for this frame. And it's not a very big field of view. Did you do any uh, deconvolution to try to quiet the stars a bit? No. Okay. No, no deconvolution or um, 
uh, star shrinking and, or using pixel math or anything like that. I'm gonna do any of that. Next one is the Crescent Nebula, where I threw a pile of, um, of a, uh, exposure time. It's H alpha O3, which was the primary thing. It's just a pure narrow band um, image. And, but I shot a really short 45 minutes each of RGB so what I, so I could actually have colorful stars. Otherwise, you get these really weird looking stars. So what you do is you process your narrow band, the actual that stuff, you remove the stars, process your green one, take the nebula out, throw the stars back in. Um, what's the Wolf Ryan star? Get little globulars here and there. Um, you can see a little bit of haze of uh, bluish green. That's all O3, that's ionized O3 gas in this whole field of view. It's a wash in it. Um, yeah, this is, uh, I love it. <laughs> Next, then, we have the Helix Nebula. I was inspired by Dave's uh, picture last year <laughs> of it, so I finally decided I better go after this since it's fairly low in Aquarius. 10 hours, uh, same thing, this is HOO. I didn't do the RGB color. Actually, I do have the RGB data, but I was lazy and didn't do them. But you can see the stars are just bland color. Um, very deep, you got all the really cool um, well, you know, in the ejecta of the center star, um, uh, 13, no, 10, 10 and a half hours. Next up is my cocoon nebula um, up in Cygnus. I spent 12 hours with this guy um, using H alpha and luminance and RGB. Just kind of did a lot of it. Um, some things of note in here is this reddish. It's not light pollution. There is actually some of the background H alpha that's just floating around in the whole region. Not very often you see that in um, cocoon shots. You just gotta get deep enough to get them. A lot of stars in here too. And then finally, my last picture is NGC 253, the Sculptor Galaxy. Um, this is crazy. This is like skimming the rooftop of my house. This is Barely, I only have like a two and a half, three hour window to image this. So this was over just to get even eight hours and 50 minutes. It almost took like seven nights here. This last clear night streak we had was basically what I focused on. Um, when the moon wasn't up, I was doing the luminance. I did 29 of them. And then the RGB and then H alpha was when the moon was up. Um, but lots of little doing the H alpha processing. You can add it in and get all the really emphasize all the star forming regions. Um, so this is really a tough target for Michigan. I got a Takahashi scope like in the observatory out west, 106. That's what I shoot mostly with. Uh, I really love the Hubble, Hubble palette here now. So that's what I mainly shoot now. So uh, I guess you can move on and get my first one in here, Richard. I'm not sure what order they're in. Still, it still ain't working. I don't know what's wrong with it. There's this. We, we've got a gremlin in here tonight for sure. That's for sure. Uh, yeah, but I use the Takahashi 106 with a Lost Mandy G11 mount. Okay, this is just a play shot here. Uh, I usually do something after I get down with the night image in and just go after one shot. This is one 900 second shot in HA and uh, processed it in pick site just a little bit. Uh, did some background extraction, a little noise reduction. So it's just one simple 900 second shot of the crescent. And uh, the next one is, it, I hope it's the black and white. No, it's not the other one. Okay, this is a IC 405 up in the upper left and 406 on the bottom. Uh, this is my longest picture I've ever taken here. I got 32 hours in it. Uh, as you can see down here in the bottom right here, it's called the tadpoles in there in the nebula. Those kind of neat little objects in there. And uh, a flaming star and a tadpole. Green laser is the bottom button there, right, right where my thumb is. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, I moved, did I do that? Probably. So it it oh, seems to work. I think I made it. I think I hit. Okay. Okay. This is a 
I see 1311. This is the fourth time I shot this thing. I had a heck of a time getting a decent picture of this. It's just, you do RGB, it's just all red, no detail. So I tried the Hubble palette. I cheated a little bit. I didn't get the right darks. I didn't have 600 second darks and I had 900 second darks. So I said, what the heck? I'll just throw some 900 second darks in there and see what happens. And that's what I came up with. So. Uh, I see 1311. I think it's up there in Cygnus, I believe. Or somewhere That's, up there. I can't quite Is that remember. the propeller nebula on the left there? Uh, oh, yeah. It looks like it. Okay. And I think I got about nine hours in this one right here. I think I got a list of everything I took. Let's see if I can. Yeah, this is all with the Takahashi except for one, my Galaxy shot. Uh, I see 1311, yeah, this is a uh, 422nd subs. Oh, that's the wrong one. I see 1311, did I get my lights here? Okay, yeah, here it is. I got 9.3 total hours. Uh, 360 second subs, 52 HA, 14 sulfur, and 27 oxygen. So, not a real good mixture, but that's all I got. Here's oh, one for you. oh, okay, that'll work. <laughs> Oh yeah, I guess that's why I'm hooked on it. You just get more details. If you took an RGB, it's just all red, basically. Okay, next one. Uh, the way you process it. Nope, went back to that one. Okay, yeah. Okay, this one I took through my refractor. That's uh, my first and only one I ever took when Nebula season left and Galaxy season came around. I hooked up my 120 refractor. And this is the first picture I took through it ever. Uh, I forget, uh, I got, let's see, uh, 9.8 hours in this one, 240 second subs, 55 hours reds, 55 green and 40 blue. So that's my first real galaxy that I ever shot, so. It's M101, right? Yep, M101. I forget what that other thing up there is called uh, next to it there. So. Yep, next one. Okay, and that first crescent I shot there is the same shot here. And I got to thinking, well, why don't I take another one next to it and try to do a mosaic? So this is actually my first mosaic. So all it is is two 900 second hydrogen alpha shots. And you just combined them and I was just amazed at how good it came out. So it was just a playing around time for me. Okay. Okay, this is the most energetic nebula I've ever photographed. Uh, NGC 7822. 422nd uh, subs. I got uh, 53 HA, 61 sulfur, and 78 oxygen. And this picture actually changed my way I'm going to do my picture taking. I always put more hydrogen alpha in I want to. You make that the most, I'm putting that at the bottom of the list. I'm going hydrogen alpha, the next highest, I'm gonna put a little more sulfur than hydrogen alpha. And then when I get to oxygen, I'm gonna put a little more oxygen than sulfur. And that's my MO from now on. Because I think the oxygen, I swear, lights up these nebulas. It's just, a, and this is like a giant cannon. If you see like a wider field picture of this area, off to the right is a round nebula. I think it's nicknamed a ro second rosette or something like that. And I swear it shot out of this thing. So, it's just amazing the detail the Hubble palette gives you. Oh, you always have to ask some hard questions. That's why I got computer. <laughs> uh, I can't remember to tell you the truth. Okay, the next one there. Oh, this is what I got away with at the getaway. I had a lot of trouble taking this. Uh, my auto guider was going to heck and my declination was jumping all around and I'm amazed I got this much. Actually, I got 30 hours into this. I was using 900 second subs, 33 HA, 38 sulfur and 47 oxygen. And uh, I had to throw out four hours worth of taking this picture because my auto guider was so bad and jumping around, I had to eliminate four hours worth of imaging. And, and the ones I did save, 
I mean, I had to throw, I would have had thrown almost everything if I was going to be a real picky. So I just threw them all together and this is what I came up with. Uh, where's the, that, oh, I changed it. Where's the, it's the bottom button. Okay. Hey, watch where you point that thing, by the way. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, it. It. I didn't see it. And yeah. this here is the bubble nebula right here. And the lobster claw here. And this little thing down here, I'm not sure. Oh, dang it. I did it again. And this little thing is pretty interesting here. I'm not sure what it is. But my first one of my first photographs I took years ago, I was using my Mead DSI 2. And oh, dang it. I got... <laughs> And my, my DSI, the image I got of this image was just about that big of an area. And that's and I thought that was an amazing shot when I took that back 15 years ago with my me DSI. <laughs> well, I didn't count them. <laughs> uh, I was up north for almost three weeks. So, oh, there's at least six or seven, I'm guessing. And I think that's, that's it. it. That's it. Okay, um, Astrophotography Night 2022, and I think it was about 1972 that we had the first one. That makes 50 years. Wow. We should have had a cake. <laughs> we got donuts. That, that's good. I don't know. Just seems to be lagging for some reason tonight. Okay, I'll just do a few. Or, or you can yeah. do it. You're, you're, you're a computer guy. I'm I'm a computer guy. I know that there's a little <laughs> keypad over here that'll handle it for me. I also know that if I move my mouse over that mark, then I can just tap. Then I can just tap. There, go. there we go. Um, this is uh, the year that I did a lot of traveling rather than working from my own observatory. So I wanted to uh, get to some dark sky sites. I wanted to get to some sites where I get some nice scenery around my pictures. And uh, I know the club has done a field trip over to the Yerkes Observatory in the past. This is what it looks like when you're looking north. Uh, it is open for visits again. If you go on a Sunday afternoon, you can get in there. Um, if you go in the evening, you can still get on the grounds and you can take pictures just like this one. Uh, if you look up at the top, I'm just using an Nikon camera, uh, Tekina, uh, 11, 16 millimeter lens. And I took 382 separate 17 second long exposures so that I could get three exposures per minute. So it's a little bit over two hours of exposure time, about two hours and seven minutes, which means that I should have uh, uh, arcs up there of about uh, 30 plus degrees. So if uh, you want to do some astronomical measurements to determine the exact timing of my uh, observations, you can go ahead and do that. Um, I used uh, startrails.exe to stack the uh, star trails and I did the cleanup work in Photoshop and I had a lot of cleanup work to do on the right side of the building because if you look at those uh, bollard lights along the base they are really bright. Uh, the people at Yerkes need to put red filters on those. Okay so we'll jump ahead. Um, I went out on uh, uh, the Amtrak train to uh, the uh, Grand Junction, Colorado, grabbed a rental car from there, and went out to visit the uh, national parks of the Southwest. Saw Arches National Park, Canyonlands National Park, um, Dead Horse Point State Park, then went on to Zion National Park. Uh, this is from Zion National Park. There's a Holiday Inn Express 
just down the road from there. You grab a, a little bus to go up into the park from there. And uh, I'm out in the parking lot. The uh, trees in the foreground are lit up by the parking lot lights. The mountains in the mid-range are lit up by the uh, city lights of Parkdale. And the uh, sky is lit up by the Milky Way. And uh, you can see a little red spot on one end. That's the Lagoon Nebula. And you can kind of make out some other little red spots working your way up. So we've, we've got a, a good chunk of the Milky Way here. Of course, I didn't stop at Zion National Park. I went on to uh, Grand Canyon National Park. We uh, stayed overnight in Grand Canyon Village and I went outside of the lodge into the parking lot. Grand Canyon Village is very careful about their lighting so that they maintain a dark sky at all times. So uh, I was able to bump the ISO speed on the camera up a little bit without picking up any background glow and uh, got a real nice exposure of Milky Way there. A little bit later at night, so it's uh, tilted up a little bit higher of an angle. Uh, these pictures were taken, well, June 26th of this year. So I came back from out west and... Uh, tap. I am eating that. There we go. Came back from out west, and uh, in August, I traveled up north. Um, if you go up to the uh, northern part of Michigan, you get out into Lake Superior at uh, Whitefish Point. There's a light station there. And this is, again, a star trail. There's only uh, 25 20 second long pictures in this one, so it's uh, not as long of a star trail. But it wasn't taken to be a star trail, it was taken to be a stacked image. So if you take the same data and stack it, you get a little bit of glow around the light and you catch a little bit of Milky Way on the north end of the picture. Uh, up in there, you can see down low, just above the foghorn, is uh, the Perseus OB Association. Up about halfway up on that same side, you see the double cluster, and you can see a little rifting in the Milky Way up there. Um, of course, uh, I'm still looking away from the Milky Way, and I like Milky Way pictures. So I went around to the other side of the lighthouse. Oh, okay. too fast. I have to find the arrow keys to go backwards. There we go. That's the one I want to do. This is where I actually got my Milky Way picture with the lighthouse uh, kind of planted right in the middle of the Milky Way. Um, I have a niece who really likes this picture. Again, uh, when I'm stacking a small number of pictures and I want to maintain the uh, foreground, I use Sequator because you can lock the foreground and uh, let all the stars accumulate. Okay, uh, I got into this theme of uh, Milky Way and lighthouses. So back at the end of August, I decided I was going to head out to uh, South Haven, Michigan. And my plan was to walk out on the north pier there, kind of toward where that green light is, and take my picture of the Milky Way uh, just past the end of the pier, next to the lighthouse. But uh, the pier was closed off because of high waves. And uh, they had like a $1,000 fine if they catch you out there. 
And I would have been out there for a while to be able to get my Milky Way picture. So I decided, no, I'm not going to do that. I'll just find a way of doing this from the beach. It's so, either amateur astronomer find $1,000 or amateur astronomer found drowned in the lake. So, Yeah, I wasn't going to get washed off the pier. I would have stayed close. I would have uh, hooked the leg around one of those uh, lamp posts or something like that. No, the, the North Pier doesn't have anything to latch on to, though. So I guess uh, sitting back on the beach is probably a better way to do this. Um, but uh, I'm still working on my lighthouses with Milky Ways in front of them. So I'll be going back out next summer to do a few more. And uh, after that, I decided I still need to get to another dark sky space. And uh, for that dark sky space, I went out to the T.K. Lawless Dark Sky Park down by, uh, uh, I guess, the closest town to it is Vandalia um, off of M60. They have plans for doing some enhancement to that park to add uh, a parking lot that's off of M60 itself instead of sending you all the way back around to Monkey Rugging Road. Uh, and that'll make it a whole lot easier to access in the future. Uh, they're also going to build a small observatory there. And uh, I think that those things will help out a lot. Uh, this particular picture is of uh, Messier 4 in the center. The bright orange dot is Antares. And we're kind of looking at the uh, back of the scorpion in the upper part of the image there. This is a, a picture that I wish I had had back when I was doing a planetarium show uh, uh, called Treasures of the Milky Way. Uh, absolutely. Ahoy, mateys. <laughs> and... Uh, I took uh, five pictures that night. I'm only going to show you three of them. So this next one is uh, the uh, globular star cluster M22. Uh, if you look, I've been shooting 220 millimeter uh, telephoto at F5. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the red cat gives you for an f-ratio but it's supposed to get you a little more light than what i'm getting but this is just a sigma telephoto lens on my nikon d5500 camera um, if i were to put it on my canon camera instead and i've got a, a similar lens to do that with i'd have gotten a whole lot more red in the background because that camera has uh uh filter that lets through a little bit more of the red end of the spectrum. Uh, when I did these pictures, I just piggybacked the camera on the Celestron 8 Ultima, which I set up in the field on a tripod. So it didn't have the world's best polar alignment. So I had to keep my exposures short, 20 second long exposures at uh, 200 millimeters is reasonable and the last one in this group is the lagoon nebula which is uh just a little bit above the spout of the teapot in uh, sagittarius and up above that the uh uh trifid nebula with the red and blue sides of it and uh, just above that and off a little bit to the left is M21, uh, an open star cluster. I don't know the designation of that one down at the bottom. I have to look that one up at some point in uh, Better Atlas than what I was using when I put this together. Uh, again, 20-second uh, exposures, 20 of them. They're stacked in sequator. Uh, you could use Deep Sky Stacker to do the stacking, but in this case, uh, Sequator was just easier for me to use because I was working with it on that day. Um, do my final adjustments in Photoshop. And 
then we move on to actually my observatory telescope. And uh, you look up there, there's the Canon 60DA. It's a little bit more sensitive to the red, so it picks up some of the red inside of the Dumbbell Nebula there. Um, these are uh, 29 two-minute exposures um, at 2,350 millimeters, F10 because it's a prime focus image. This is the last picture taken with the Canon 60DA camera because uh, I went out and spent a little bit of money and got myself a filter wheel and an ASI 1600mm and a set of filters. And then I have uh, assembled the filters on my clean table. And I put all the gear into the observatory. And that was, uh, let's see, the whole thing was delivered six weeks ago. And I've been gone a good chunk of that time, but I'm back and I have been able to take two test exposures. The first one being an RGB image, uh, Three minute exposures are what I'm working with right now just to get a feel for how everything's working. I have to rebalance the telescope a little bit. Um, I only got three good red ones. I got nine green ones and eight blue ones. I'm trying to shoot 12 at a time. So I'm having a little bit of guiding trouble and I have to throw out uh, about a third of the images I take right now. I'll get back to uh, getting things evened out once I balance the telescope out. But you can see that there's a, a little more sharpness in this image than there was in the uh, image taken with the Canon camera. And uh, then I put in the uh, H, uh, hydrogen alpha, oxygen, and sulfur filters and reshot the image through those filters. Lost a lot of the stars in that, but I'm getting my full 12 exposures on the three minute exposures. So I'm at the point where I'm able to get the light in, have a, a little bit more work to do on that, but this object is gone for the year from my observing site. So I'm not gonna be able to do anything more with it. And I'm looking for something else that's going to be kind of colorful, kind of in the middle southern sky. And I look at that part of the sky right now, and there is nothing in that part of the sky other than a bunch of galaxies and uh, star clusters. So nebulosity is going to have to wait until something else moves in. I believe that's my final image. We'll just check real quick. And yeah, that is it. All right. Thank you, Eric. All right, everyone. Thanks for uh, those of you that stuck around with us. And again, uh, sorry about the uh, delay tonight. But remember, don't blame me. Blame this. The crappy battery that slowed us down tonight. It, it, it's obviously your fault. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Let me get, get get up the agenda here. All right, so I know we don't have too many people left here, uh, but does anyone have any observing reports they wanted to share real quick? Sinclair? Um, for three or four days, I did a lot of new observing, watching as it worked its way from um, a pretty young crescent into uh, just past first quarter, back some gibbous, then the clouds started to come in, kind of drifted away from it. But it was very nice. The Terminator one was very clean. We had really good observing weather going outside. The past so I have been doing more lunar observing lately, but I was back to month. I was talking to Joe about sketching, a lot more sketching. I'm planning to do some of that. 
Can you say all that again? No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Anybody else have any observing reports? Joe? I, I also look at the moon. You know, that moon, that, that just isn't anything better for it. Oh, that's a moon. Oh, <laughs> the only thing worse than the moon is the four points by Sheridan on Cork Street. <laughs> okay. Uh, Bert, I just want to mention, you know, the Saturn and Jupiter are out in the moon. So, so, so that um, I'm sure it was very clear, it's probably very clear right now because we're actually six feet high. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it'll rain, no, never mind. We almost rain. But uh, Mercury is also uh, coming up in the north. This is an ideal time to see Mercury in the north. I, I just like see, I don't really look at it as a thing. I just look at it as a Anybody else have any observing reports? Jack, I saw you first. There we go. Uh, a few weeks ago, Scott and I and Scott's brother were up in Greenland Park and stuff like that. Thursday night was fabulous. I don't think I've seen a clear, clear sky that night. We could see Andromeda galaxy, naked eye, directly with the enough to be the word of the That is just gorgeous. Cold as Friday morning, you know, 40 degrees in the sky. And then as the day went by Friday, we knew the clouds rolled in. And Friday night, we could see Jupiter once in a while. And we looked at the one in the sky, and hoped that that was a good spot. And um, the other way, we looked at another white light scattered. And then Saturday, it rained on and off. And they had their program at 6 o'clock, road by 7, and the traffic jam, everybody getting out of there. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I don't think hardly anybody stayed overnight Saturday. We were gone. So. Sort of things that Sunday we left on Saturday night. I drove home from Saturday night to stay there. But we had a we had a good time. It was enjoyable. Top and Donna? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I did I did get a one of the door prizes was an observing package with a, a laminated knee pad that you pulled out and of course we looked at and there was a couple other observing packages that were fun. The trace we just went next week. I looked at the website. They didn't seem to really have any speakers. Yeah, they had their own people from colleges. They did a yeah. Eight, uh, uh, three. 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 Helium. 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 Do you think that was because of the pandemic, or is it kind of a star party in decline? Well, it's been in decline, but I think because of the pandemic, they didn't hold it. Yeah. Well, because there, there's this thing called the moon. <laughs> Not for a star party. It's called the star party. Any other observing reports? Yeah. Yeah, I'll just say that. Giovanni and Amadelli were in college, and 
I'm an excellent teacher. Welcome. Any other observing? Um, I'll mention real quick. We need a camera operator. We'll go back over here. Um, hopefully, I'll be on the whole picture there. But I, I mentioned last month I was going to go to the um, astronomy at the beach. Over, it's north of Ann Arbor. Um, I, I'm forgetting the name of the park again. Um, because I was going to check it out because uh, someone mentioned that we, you know, maybe the KS could participate in uh, th this event in the future. And if we were to participate, I would only uh, commit to Saturday because, you know, I, I, I've heard from Bill Nig, I've read reports online and heard word of mouth that, you know, they get like two, three thousand people at this thing. But apparently it's just on Saturday because uh, when I went on Friday and, you know, uh, hung around with the solar observers, you know, there there weren't thousands or even hundreds. It, eventually, the 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 parking lot started to fill in as they got closer to the talks. Uh, so so people on Friday come for the talks, which makes sense because you're not out of work till five, and uh, talks don't start till seven or eight. So um, you know, it it is like a two hour drive. So I don't know how many members. You know, it's hard enough to get members out to the you know nature center uh, as opposed to um, you know the, the opposite side of the state. But, uh, you know, um, next time I'll, I'll try to go on a Saturday uh, when we don't have, hopefully we won't have a public observing session the, the same night and uh, check it out. But, you know, it could be fun to set up the solar telescope and have that, you know, explain what a sunspot is for, you know, 500 times a day or something like that. So that's fun. We've done that before. Okay. Yeah. Observing Yes. I know Roger, who Roger's already took off. I know he, he he's done some variable star stuff, but uh, we've had a guy give presentations in the past uh, that lives on the again the opposite side of the state. Uh, boy, he he's really hardcore into that. He's he's a big part of the AABSO and all that. I can't recall his name off the top of my head right now, but I just can't figure out how they can measure the magnitude. And there's uh, Dale uh, Dale Mayus too. He does uh, spectroscopy at his observatory down like in St. Joseph County. He might be a good contact. I think I think he might do some variable star stuff as well. Yeah, he he's probably the main one in the club that I would go to. So if you email me, I can send you his contact info or forward your info to him. And we could do that. All right. Any astronomical news and events? You know, I'm glad like uh, Channel 3 did not contact me to ask me about Artemis because I would just frankly tell them I don't really care. It, it, it's not, you know, space exploration, at least not yet. You know, they'll, they'll get to the moon eventually, but not, then I'll get a little excited, but, you know, it's just a rocket going off. If I was there, I'd be really excited, but I don't, I don't get the fascination of seeing rockets go off on TV. It's like watching golf. It's like the same every time. So, yeah. Yeah. And I wrote about DART. That went really well. Apparently, there's supposed to be a press conference coming up uh, soon, but it seems like it's too soon to know if it shifted the orbit of the poor little asteroid. And... Yeah. Took him long enough. Pete, <laughs> hey, did you have something?
Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Can we? Yeah, I think our chances are. <laughs> we missed the good one this year. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. There's not too many news, and I know we are we are way way over thanks to that freaking battery or anything. Uh, we have a public observing session on Saturday, October fifteenth. Uh, if it's clear. Of course, OWL will be open. We need members to bring telescopes. And I know Pete will be there to run the dive. Otherwise, I will hunt you down like a dog. Or I hope Sinclair come after you with his baseball bat. Uh, then we have the Observing SIG at Richland Township Park. That's on Tuesday, October 18th. And uh, we are kind of getting into the time of year where you can really probably even observe earlier than 8 o'clock. Um, and then we have the return of the Astrophotography Special Interest Group. Uh, I decided to go ahead and do a second season just to see how they do in person because I was just kind of curious. Uh, so, yeah, this will be our very first uh, uh, AP SIG meeting in person at WMU Rood Hall in room 1110. We've, we've done general meetings and gadget nights and full moon theaters there before. Um, just remember, I will try to try to re-emphasize this in emails, but after six o'clock on Friday, you can park in the employee lot with no problem. Uh, you know, there'll be plenty of room. We never have any issues looking for a good parking spot in the uh, lot just outside Everett Tower, Rood Hall. So uh, we have an excellent speaker. Um, we have, uh, oh gosh, I can't remember his name. Uh, Jason Grungle, I can't. I got to work on his last name. He's a photographer uh, or an astrophotographer over by Midland, Michigan. Uh, and he's really, really good. I mean, uh, he, he has this website called Vast Reaches or Vast Horizons. Yeah. And uh, there, there's a link to his website in the newsletter and the poster I have in the newsletter. And uh, uh, that'll be a more general presentation, not really technical. Uh, Pete will be doing the technical talk in December with flat fields and stuff like that. So, yeah. Um, but the but the the uh, October meeting that we have here in two weeks uh, is meant for anyone that likes to look at pretty pictures like tonight, uh, especially when we have less technical issues. Because I know not to use that freaking battery. And um, and again, he's really, really good. He'll be joining us uh, via Zoom because he didn't want to drive over from the east side of the state, and I don't blame him. But I will send out a reminder about, uh, about that on uh, by email. Then we have our final public observing session of the year on October 29th. Hopefully the skies will be clear. We haven't pulled off a October session in quite a while, so it'll be nice to actually do one because we pretty much get to observe like almost right away. Because it, it gets dark pretty quick in uh, October, e even with daylight time. As usual, uh, the deadline for the newsletter is um, the 15th of every month. So if you have any submissions for Prime Focus, I know I might be bugging some of you about your astro photos to use in the newsletter if the PowerPoint version isn't sufficient enough to put in the newsletter. So you might be hearing from me. And other, other items I just wanted to mention, just because it is kind of astronomically related, is uh, my parents are out west right now, and uh, just today uh, they were at Meteor Crater, and they they called me and said that was pretty cool because uh, yesterday they went to the Grand Canyon because uh, they meant to do this trip in 2019, but then the world ended, and so they didn't want to go out west and uh, you know probably get COVID, which I'll probably get now anyway. But um, so they at the Grand Canyon yesterday, then they went to Meteor Crater today because today was their open day. They weren't sure what to do. I mentioned, we'll just go, how about Meteor Crater? It's another big hole in the ground, but it's a really cool one. So apparently they, they, they did go there and they enjoyed it very, very much. Anybody have any other things they wanted to mention? Karen? There she is. There's the librarian. <laughs> okay. And, and our library is uh, sitting. Uh, oh, there it is over there. See that cart? That's the library. <laughs> Get everyone at home sick. Ho hope
they took the Dramamine. Anybody have anything else? All right. Next month, uh, we're getting back to the more uh, mainstream uh, topics for those of you that are the armchair astronomers. Uh, so next month, we have Professor Larry Molnar from Calvin University. He was the subject of Luminous, that documentary we watched uh, uh, November of last year via Zoom. He'll be talking about the backstory of contact binary stars, which is his main area of research. Now, I know we don't have too many people here. I'm about ready to kind of just give up on this part of the meeting altogether. But do we have any volunteers to provide snacks for the September meeting? You know, the usual assortment of cookies and soft drinks. Did I say September? Yeah. Well we'll, well, we'll we'll get you next year then for sure. November. Do we have any uh, volunteers to bring snacks for November? Okay. So without further ado, uh, we're about nine twenty nine. We will adjourn.